Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Supriya and I'm, I work as a techno commercial manager at Genotypic. I would like to welcome you all to the Genotypics webinar series. Just to give you all a brief of who we are, Genotypic Technology is the first genomic service provider in India. It was established in 1998, providing microarray, next generation sequencing, bioinformatic services and solutions to domestic, international pharma, biotech companies and academia. Clients worldwide make use of genotypic services for a range of services from protocol optimization, probe designing, array layouts, project designing, procedure standardization, platform standardizations, nucleic acid analysis to in-depth analysis. Work done at Genotypic is acknowledged and cited over 500 publications. Today, we'll be joined by Dr. Sudha Rao, who is the executive director of Genotypic Technology. Dr. Sudha has over two decades of experience as a researcher and as an entrepreneur. She earned her PhD in biotechnology from Madurai Kamaraj University, followed by her postdoctoral studies in neurobiology at Cornell Medical School, New York. She has worked as a consultant for Quark Pharma Israel. She was also a visiting scientist at Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore. She has been an instrumental she has been instrumental in establishing Genotypic as a world-class genomics facility, which is today a technology partner for all biological researchers. As a success, successful entrepreneur, she has her second stint at, entrepreneurs, at entrepreneurship with her clinical diagnostics venture, Dithiomics Technologies, in 2014. Dithiomics provides molecular diagnostic services leveraging from some of the most experienced researchers and experts in the field of genomics, healthcare, and technology. Today, Dr. Sudha Rao will be talking about the overview of nanopore sequencing technology and the very sought after Arctic protocol in the SARS-CoV-2 sequencing. Without further ado, let's get started. Welcome, Dr. Sudha. Thank you, Supriya. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's wonderful to be able to speak to all of you. Um, thanks to technology that's available now. And despite the lockdowns that have locked us down in our houses and offices, um, we've all been affected by a virus um, of an unprecedented scale. And um, there is a global effort to better understand this virus and combat it and bring it to a stop as soon as humankind can do so. Um, some of these efforts have focused on understanding the viral genome. And I will speak to you about what Genotypic does and what are the technologies that are available for rapid sequencing of the 30 KB SARS-CoV-2 genome uh, using mobile uh, technologies. So a, a quick introduction about our company. Um, we've been in this business for over 20 years now and um, starting as a technology company uh, that aimed or endeavored to bridge the gap between biology and technologies. So over the past two decades, we have adopted, optimized, implemented, and innovated in the genomic space um, across next generation sequencing, microarrays, and other molecular methods. And uh, we're proud to say that work done at Genotypic has enabled publications, and many PhD theses in our country and globally as well. As part of this effort, we have partnered with multiple technology companies and have incorporated their products and also helped in method improvement for these companies. So as we all know, um, I mean, starting from birth to the time we die, um, we encounter many diseases. And these are caused by a variety of organisms that 
exist in our environment, starting from several species of bacteria that can affect us through many organs, including skin and internal organs, to parasites like protozoans and nematodes. Fungi, um, Candida is a very well-known species, um, and uh, predominantly uh, viruses. Typically viruses um, of the influenza kind come again and again every year, and there are a few vaccines for some of these um, viral diseases. Today, we're going to talk about one of those deadly viruses, which is the SARS-CoV-2, which causes a disease uh, leading to death in about 2% of the infected individuals. As we know, uh, as we combat so many different types of bugs um, that affect the humankind, it's very important to be able to have the right weapons to be able to interrogate, understand, and counter these organisms that affect human beings. So um, one of the early publications um, in Cell by Kim et al. Um, delineated the uh, genome of the SARS-CoV-2. And what they did was to do direct RNA sequencing using a combination of methods, including the uh, long read nanopore sequencing, as well as um, the uh, short read Illumina sequencing. And broadly what they understood of this um, genome, and this was of course, um, the RNA was generated by infecting the uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus into a cell line and extracting the RNA and sequencing the total RNA from the cell extract. So, um, this effort led to an understanding of the structure of the SARS-CoV-2 um, RNA genome, uh, which is about 30 kilobases long and has two ORFs, which is called the genomic RNA. And there are several subgenomic uh, canonical and non-canonical RNAs. Some of these code for structural proteins and the others are various polymerases, proteases, and other genes that allow the viral genome to infect and survive and propagate across human cells. So the current challenge is understanding um, the genome of the SARS-CoV-2. As we all know, um, as many countries and their leaders have spoken to um, all of us, the current effort has been on testing, diagnosing, and implementing ways of preventing further infection in the population. And uh, one of the uh, predominantly used methods to do this is what is called as um, an RT-PCR, which essentially targets a certain part of the genome by reverse transcription and PCR, and allows us to identify such subjects who are infected. Now, many of these methods have their own pros and cons, uh, one of which is an inability to detect it, which is false negatives, either because of the non-performance of the kit, the way the samples were collected, or because um, the uh, viral loads were insufficient. So one of the technologies that has been at the forefront of understanding the genome as well as sequencing is um, Oxford Nanopore's uh, Minion sequencing. This is a device that is small, portable, and has been shown to be very effective in sequencing genomes at the field level and first implemented with the uh, Zika viruses. So with respect to the, uh, when the COVID epidemic was first um, announced uh, by the Chinese uh, government, the uh, endeavor was to uh, sequence the original strain from Wuhan. And once this was done, they were able to confirm the human to human transmission. And uh, subsequently in the month of uh, February, uh, they 
enabled other countries to start sequencing using the um, Arctic protocol, which I'll describe as we go um, across um, several other countries, including Belgium, Canada, and Brazil. And um, in the month of March, um, this led, this protocol was very, very widely adapted across several countries, uh, about 30 of them. And this was in the month of March, we are now in the month of May, and we will see how this has now been adapted in India as well. Um, as you know, we have more than about uh, 150 installations um, in India of the Mineon device, and also a, a couple of uh, Gridion sequencers, which is a high throughput machine. And all of these are enabling rapid sequencing of the SARS-CoV-2 genome, as well as doing direct RNA sequencing which is possible currently only with the nanopore sequencing method. So um, how are you, I mean, scientists using this uh, in, in their research on this uh, deadly disease? Um, typically samples are collected and to give an Indian context, these are just tubes that, you know, collect the nasopharyngeal um, uh, material from subjects who are suspected to have the disease or who have symptoms or who have had contact with individuals who had the disease. Samples are collected and the first confirmatory test is an RT-PCR test by approved kits and methods. And once the infection is confirmed, the SARS-CoV-2 positive samples are taken for further analysis, while the negative samples can be used as negative controls in the subsequent downstream analysis using other methodologies. So one of the approaches um, people do for SARS-CoV-2 sequencing by nanopore is to do targeted sequencing. Now, why do we do targeted sequencing? If you look at um, viruses, uh, they need a host cell to replicate and express themselves. So when you extract RNA from host cells, uh, depending on the viral load, more than 90% of the RNA that you have will be from the host, which is not what you're looking for. And if you were to sequence the entire transcriptome, it will be very expensive. So there is a need for an approach to do targeted sequencing of just the viral genome. There are several approaches one could take, including bait-based captures after CDNA preparation or uh, more widely used um, amplicon-based sequencing. Since the publication of the uh, genome, since we know the sequence of the Wuhan strain, um, the Arctic group went on to develop a set of primers, about 120 primer pairs, which would essentially cover the entire 30 kilo base genome as 400 base amplicons and created this uh, panel for whole genome sequencing. So this protocol allows a scientist or a researcher to go from RNA of the patient sample to a sequence within seven hours, which currently is the fastest protocol available for such genome level sequencing. What do they do with it? This allows them to do epidemiological studies, understand where the infection originated uh, in the individual. Did it come from Mumbai? Did they come from Chennai? Did they come from Coimbatore? Um, what is the mutation rate? Um, how is the disease spreading? And also identification of clusters of transmission. The second approach is to do what is called as metagenomic sequencing, which is an unbiased sequencing of all potential metagenomes that could be in the sample. This is important because many other disorders have symptoms very similar to the COVID-19. And when you do metagenome sequencing, it helps us to identify other infectious agents that could be causing the disease. This will allow us to now understand the actual number of cases that are COVID-19 versus those that are not COVID-19 with the similar symptoms, right? So, there are multiple approaches to this, typically either doing an RNA metagenomic run or DNA metagenome sequencing. So if one is doing bacterial metagenomes, one could do 16S RNA or one could do whole genome metagenome sequencing. 
all of the whole genome matter genome sequencing be it rna or dna will involve substantial amount of sequencing because they all come from host and they have to eliminate or sequence sufficiently to be able to have coverage for the infectious agents and once you have this data what do you do with them right so one of the basic questions is why why do different people have different symptoms right somebody who is almost asymptomatic to somebody who dies within two weeks of infection we have the whole spectrum of phenotypes or symptoms that individuals um, show and are these a result of the viral strains they're infected with or what is the immune repertoire of the um, you know SARS-CoV infected patients and this is done by sequencing the full immune cell receptor genes and their transcripts. And finally, the um, whole genome sequencing, the direct RNA sequencing, allows us to sequence RNA as it is and understand not just the length and breadth of the RNA, but also the modifications that have happened in the genome, including methylation and other changes. Because we do know that at least in many biological systems, beyond sequence information, a lot of modifications either allow or disallow the protein synthesis from transcripts. So it is very important to understand the modifications of a genome as well. So just to give you a, a, a perspective of you know, how, how much sequencing has happened worldwide, um, as we know, as of uh, two days ago, there have been about 24,462 submissions for uh, the SARS-CoV-2 genome in the um, GISAID platform, which is the global, uh, I will speak about it a little later. And um, predominantly, uh, these have been by nanopore sequencing. As you see, there are about 30% uh, of them come from nanopore sequencing. And we see a similar trend with the Indian submissions as well. There are about 195 Indian submissions into the genome um, database and uh, 120 of those were sequenced using the Nanopore platform. Uh, the other, uh, of course, platforms have been the uh, Illumina, Ion Torrent and Sanger. And um, beyond the NovaSeq, which is a very, very high throughput machine. Uh, the MySeq is a pl popular platform which has been used for sequencing the COVID genome. So beyond diagnostics with PCR and antibody-based tests of diagnosing an individual as positive or negative for the infection, uh, why do we need to do sequencing? As I described in my previous slide, um, Epidemiological research depends heavily on sequence information for tracing the geographical spread of the disease. Vaccine development to understand epitopes and variations to the viral genomes across geographies is very, very important. A vaccine that is effective in India may not be effective in China, for example, if the epitopes can be different, which is the case with HIV, for example, where it's been a very big challenge to develop a vaccine. Understanding the infection biology is very important. And analysis of mutations in the viral strain, which could confer differential virulence across geographies is important to understand. And also importantly, reconfirmation of results that have been obtained from qPCR and antibody testing on batches of samples is important to do. So I'm sure many of you have heard of this word Arctic. It's not Arctic as in the poles, but um, it's a network that was created um, early, I, mean, I think a couple of years ago when the Ebola virus a few years ago um, to do sequencing on the ground um, for the Ebola virus. And it's a network of um, several universities um, in the UK and in the US. 
And they have now protocols for sequencing of Ebola virus, measles, and the uh, SARS-CoV-2. So this is uh, basically a seven R protocol, which goes from RNA to cDNA synthesis to um, barcoding samples, and then sequencing on the portable Oxford nanopore Meleon sequencer. Um, Josh Quick is the author of these protocols, and these are available for anyone to use. So some of the key features of this protocol are um, a very highly efficient um, primer pool, optic primer pool for COVID sequence, um, SARS-CoV sequencing. Uh, these are two primer pools and they ensure uniform amplification of the complete genome, even from compromised samples. One has to be aware that uh, from samples being collected at multiple locations, especially in countries like India, uh, the logistics can be challenging. And by the time the sample reaches the uh, sequencing center, it could be partially or completely compromised, these being RNA viruses. And it's important to have a robust protocol that can sequence the sample, even compromised samples. Um, the second one is, of course, the, the uh, ease of doing nanopore sequencing with a very, very rapid turnaround time. Nanopore sequencing allows us to do real-time analysis. So one can decide when to stop the sequencing and proceed with analysis and reporting. And uh, the protocol allows one to do the near complete sequence of the viral genome, provided there has been no recombinations or deletions in the sample. And it's also coupled with uh, a very nicely optimized analysis pipeline for cons consensus generation and SNP analysis. So basically, the entire workflow from sample to report is about seven hours. So what does it do? Um, this is how the genome uh, looks, the, the 30, nearly 30 kilo basis of it. And as you see at the bottom of the cartoon, um, there are about 120 primer pairs, uh, overlapping primer pairs that capture the entire genome uh, across from uh, base one to base 29674. The reason this strategy has been developed is because um, the the two primer pools will ensure that even if there's a drop off at uh, by one of the primer pairs um, because either of because of mutations or any changes in the viral genome you would have um, an overlapping amplicon in the other pool so this strategy allows you to ensure that you get the complete genome with very few dropout regions so how, what, what is the protocol all about? Um, so essentially, you would get your clinical sample. Um, please be careful. There are many um, preservative buffers and kits that are currently available in the market. It's very important to ensure that the sample collection ensures the integrity of the sample during transit from sample collection to the sequencing lab. So once the clinical sample is connect, collected, um, there's an optimized RNA extraction protocol, which ensures maximum recovery of the sample and integrity of the sample. So once the RNA is extracted, one would proceed like any other cDNA synthesis with uh, first-strand synthesis using uh, random hexamer primers, and sometimes in combination with an oligo-DT primer. The SARS-CoV-2 RNA genome has a poly-A, and oligo-DT can be also used in combination with random hexamer primers. But it is essential to use random hexamers, otherwise you'll have a three prime bias in your cDNA. Once the cDNA is synthesized, you now use targeted primers. The original Arctic protocol uses two primer pools, one and two, and we have slightly modified it based on our experience with certain underperforming primers as a pool three. So you would multiplex them, so half of them on one and half of them on the other. And the multiplex PCR pooled amplified targets are then combined into one tube 
And now that one tube is representative of the entire genome as 400 base pair amplicons. Now these are then end repaired and made into a library along with PCR barcoding. Barcoding is essential because you're going to use multiple samples on a sequencing run and barcoding allows us to identify which sample the sequencing leads are coming from. Once the samples are barcoded, they're all pulled together and then they're made into a library for sequencing on the Minion. And post-sequencing, bioinformatic analysis is done. So just a very quick slide on what is nanopore sequencing. As the name says, um, this is sequencing enabled by nanopores, um, which are membrane proteins uh, derived from E. coli originally. And um, basically the cDNA or PCR product is made to pass through a pore. And as it passes through a pore, it so there's current passing through the pore because of the buffers that are there in the um, sequencing flow cell. And once the DNA is passing through the pore, it impedes current and this is measured as changes in the current flow. And um, it, it creates patterns called squiggles. These squiggles are then translated into sequence information. So what do you see when you do nanopore sequencing? This, this is a screenshot of the um, uh, user interface on the um, sequencing gridion or nanominion sequencer, which gives you uh, a snapshot of um, how many pores in the flow cell are occupied. And uh, all the green dots are looking good. And what is the read length? Of course, this, this uh, screenshot is not from a, a SARS-CoV-2 sequencing readout, but this is from another genome. Um, and so this is just a snapshot of the quality of sequencing uh, that you have started, right? So pore occupancy, read length, and trace views are some important quality criteria for uh, assessing the quality of the sequencing run. So once the sequencing is done, it gives out what are called as fast five reads. And the FAST5 reads are converted into FASTQ reads, which is basically your sequence information with um, quality information, and then converted to FASTA reads for further analysis of the genome. So once you've sequenced, um, there is a, a pipeline called Rampart, which allows you to do real-time analysis of the genomes that you're sequencing. Why do you need real time? Uh, for two reasons. One is it allows you to quickly see the coverage across all the amplicons of the genome. So if you see this panel on the top and bottom in B01 and two or two different samples, and you see that you have differential coverage of the amplicons across the entire length of the genome. And uh, what Rampart does is it does a real time sequencing and mapping of the reads to tell you when you have adequate coverage of the entire genome, which is a minimum of 100x uh, for any amplicon. Once you've achieved that sequencing depth, you can stop the run and proceed for analysis. And typically this is about one to two hours for a good run of 24 samples on a Minion flow cell. So the Rampart protocol basically um, uses the, uh, either the Minion base calling um, it uses the minimum base calling and then um, does a quick minimap alignment and Medica based consensus and variant calling. And once the consensus is generated, it, you can also do the identification of mutations, uh, variants, and phylogeny analysis. So the basic steps in this are base calling and then mapping the reads to the viral genome and then calling, generating a consensus and calling variants. So what do you need? What do you need to get this beautiful picture on your laptops or computers that you're using for analysis, right? So some very, very basic chemistries and concoctions that 
rapidly allow you to become a genomics expert. So uh, the first component is, of course, generating the cDNA and the genome amplification. Right? So basically, this includes your RT, your TAC polymerase, uh, the primer pools, the random hexamers, uh, hexamers and the DNTP solutions. Once you're ready with your amplified genome of the SARS-CoV-2, you next move on to making the um, libraries, first by barcoding each sample and then making a pool of them and making a library for sequencing, right? So these have what are called as end repair and DA tailing module, which is essential to repair the ends of the amplified um, PCR amplicons as well as a quick tailing that allows efficient ligation of the adapters. Then there's a ligation module. There's a native barcoding kit, which basically adds barcodes to each of the samples for further demultiplexing and identification. And then there's a DNA repair mix. Once you have made the library, there is what is called as a ligation sequencing kit and the flow cell, which allow you to sequence the library on the meneon. There are some associated reagents like the um, beads for cleanup of the libraries, uh, cleaning up of all the adapters and other things. And um, if you choose to do, you can also do um, a quantification of the libraries by using the Agilent tape station or qubits. And um, the hardware that you would need for doing this is the uh, Mineon sequencer and a control system or a, a computer system that has all the necessary software for the analysis of the sequence data. So this the system will allow you to both capture the data and also do the analysis. So um, what do we also provide um, as, as a kit is, as I mentioned in my previous slide, uh, at Genotypic we have uh, synthesized primer pools for immediate sequencing. These have been tested, validated, and optimized uh, to be ready for SARS-CoV-2 sequencing by Indian researchers. So these come in uh, different kit sizes, um, including 1,000, 200, and 100 uh, sample kit sizes. And we also have tested um, optimal reverse transcriptase and proofreading polymerases that can go along with these primers for the PCR amplification of the SARS-CoV-2 genomes. Um, so along with the supply of the reagents, we also provide the uh, support on the uh, procurement of uh, the Minion sequencer. Basically, this has multiple components. Uh, one is the uh, base unit, which is the hardware. And then you have what is called the flow cell that fits into that, in which you will load, load your libraries. The hardware, the base unit has sensors, uh, uh, a sensor chip with multiple uh, nanopores. And there is a USB power device, which helps you to connect to the laptop. And uh, there is also, the chips come in two sizes. One is a standard chip, which um, generates about 20 to 30 GB of data, depending on the sample type. And there's also a smaller one called the Flongle, uh, which gives you about 1.8 GB to 3 GB of data output. Um, on this, you would be able to sequence about 12 samples on the Flongle, whereas with the uh, Minion Pro cell, the R R9 Pro cells, you could do um, 24 samples because that is the number of barcodes that are currently available, although the data outputs allow you to sequence um, many more samples than 24. Um, coupled with this, we also support with uh, a tool that has been developed at Genotypic uh, called uh, Commander. Uh, this is uh, to enable biologists who are not familiar with command prompt and can, with a click of a button, quickly do base calling, trimming, filtering, uh, convert formats and report and uh, statistics generation. So that's on the uh, product side. We also help researchers who um, do not have access to labs or cannot set up um, sequencing facilities by offering services 
for the um, SARS-CoV-2 sequencing. These are done only for research samples and we do not have uh, services for diagnostics at the moment. Um, this is not just for the SARS-CoV-2 sequencing, but we also, apart from the whole viral genome sequencing, we help researchers to do metagenome sequencing as well as direct RNA sequencing and even the host transcriptome analysis to understand the biology of the uh, COVID-19 disease. So um, some of the publications on the uh, genomes from India include the one from um, IAC, Dr. Kumar Somasundram's lab, uh, there are a couple of papers from Dr. Partha's lab in NIBMG, um, Kalyani, Calcutta. And uh, there have been uh, a significant number of submissions um, on the uh, GSAID database. Uh, this, is, uh, this was uh, initially a global initiative for uh, uh, sharing of the influenza data, which is also um, something that comes year on year. And, um, and now this initiative has expanded into including data from the SARS-CoV-2 genomes. And it currently has upwards of 24,000 uh, sequences. And um, researchers are free to download data, analyze, compare their genomes, and uh, look at variants and many more things that one would want to do from uh, genome analysis. So this is um, a comparison of the um, Indian uh, genome submissions on the same site. Um, this has been provided by um, IGIB Delhi. And some of these came from submissions in IGIB. Uh, there were a few from Nimhans, Bangalore, some from um, Ahmedabad and uh, other uh, ICMR institutions um, across India. So um, there are quite a few publications um, using nanopore sequencer for uh, understanding the uh, COVID disease all the way from um, direct RNA sequencing and evolution of SARS-CoV-2 to uh, looking at the variations uh, across the genome and looking at population structure, um, genomics and uh, many more. And these are coming more and more, um, more and more publications are coming up rapidly um, across, you know, multiple countries. So um, this is all about the sequencing and I'm happy to take questions uh, from people, either on the protocol or kits and reagents or services that you might have. Thank you, Dr. Sudha. That was indeed a very informative presentation. I request all the participants to raise hands so that you can ask you can interact with Dr. Sudha and ask your question. Uh, Dr. Naveen, Dr. Naveen has a question, Dr. Sudha. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sudha and uh, Genotepic for organizing uh, uh, the webinar on Nanopore. And uh, so we do have a mm -hmm. Nanopore in our laboratory that we bought from Genotepic. And my question is like, um, the first thing is like, uh, the protocol uh, says about 400 base pair, right? Yes. So usually Nanopore um, uh, doesn't support like the short reads. So do we need to go for any overlapping PCR between these pools or like uh, just 400 base pair is enough? No, so the, the workflow has been optimized to be able to um, analyze 400 base fragments. Mm -hmm. And uh, this workflow, basically by workflow, I mean all the way from sample preparation to sequence analysis. Um, that is not an issue uh, with the 400 yeah. base pair reads. Yeah, because like when we generally do, right, we do face a lot of um, uh, problem with the short reads in uh, Nanopore. Yeah. 
Um, if you have your reads less than 100 bases, yes, it could be a challenge, but 400 is a good enough length for nanopore analysis. Okay. Yes. So my, my question is like, um, uh, when we do multi, uh, uh, multiplexing with these uh, SARS-CoV samples, right? Yes. Two samples. Uh, generally, these nanopores, are like, um, uh, because we have seen this like in previous our works, like they do uh, have a mixing of uh, barcodes with other samples when we do the filtering process, yes. demultiplexing. So we could to see that. So in case of SARS-CoV, it is really uh, much more. Uh, we should be very cautious because we could see a lot of mutations occurring in um, uh, a different part of the world. So how how effective it would be like do a multiplexing in case of SARS-CoV two. Um, in nanopore. So the analysis pipeline um, has a filtering mechanism where you, you need to have uh, um, barcodes on both sides matching, right? So that's one okay. of the key criteria for filtering. And that eliminates possibilities of cross contamination from other samples. Okay. Yeah. So my last question is like, um, uh, uh, do we need to uh, go for a like um, uh, random examiners or like we can use the same uh, pools for the conversion of cDNA because that will be much more specific uh, rather than uh, converting all the human uh, reads as well, right? So this has been a question, um, I think, uh, across uh, multiple labs. Some people have tested doing this this is with the targeted primers. Uh, but I think the lab results indicate that the two-step process is much more efficient and uniform than directly using primers for the cDNA synthesis. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Dr. Thank you. Uh, we have um, Ashwani Sharma who has a question. Hello, Ashwani. Hello. Yes. So my question is, uh, what is the progress of the RNA? Like, can we uh, do the RNA directly for the sequencing? What length RNA can be sequenced? Or uh, what's the progress about that? Because I'm, I'm, I'm not really updated about that with the nanopore. So I, is the question on direct RNA sequencing? Yes, right, yes. Yes, direct RNA sequencing is possible. And I sh the, uh, the picture I shared of the genome structure was actually done on uh, by direct RNA sequencing on the nanopore. Basically, um, it involves an oligo-DT-based sequencing. And um, you cannot do targeted sequencing with direct RNA sequencing at the moment. It will be a whole transcriptome analysis. Okay, so small... And it captures the entire length of the transcript. Okay, the small RNAs we cannot do, like, say, if I have around 200, 300 RNAs, that cannot be done directly or can be done? Targeted sequencing, no. Okay. Not for direct RNA sequencing. Okay, okay. Thank, thank you so much. There is one more very common question, Dr. Sudha, asking what is the reason for choosing the depth of sequencing, which is 100x? Is there a reason behind 100x? No, um, 100x is minimum, but that's not an ideal uh, sequencing depth. Um, you would look at an average of 1,000x um, because um, you have to generate consensus um, to ensure that you have uh, high quality uh, readout and an overall average coverage of 1000x is highly recommended with a minimum coverage of 100x. Uh, this is just as a quality um, threshold that you would do 100x. If you can do more, it is better. And uh, the reason for Arctic, which uses the sh shorter reads in case there is a degradation of RNA. Yes. And this will not uh, miss parts of the genome. So if the uh, genome is not covered um, in the sample, if the region is not covered in the sample, then, sorry, one moment. Oh, um, I'm sorry. Uh, the question was, why do we choose nanopore for shorter reads when actually nanopore has the capability of sequencing full length cDNAs? So the reason um, they have optimized with uh, shorter amplicons is because um, these are clinical samples and they're going to come from different parts um, of the country, you know, different conditions. 
and one would not know the integrity of the sample and the idea is to be able to try and capture the entire genome even if it is slightly degraded and if one were to use um, very large amplicons which theoretically is possible and should be the approach for nanopore the reason it's not done is for two reasons one is uh, like i said if the samples are compromised and fragmented then uh, your pcr will not be efficient and number two is that pcr is a lot more efficient with uh, shorter amplicons than very large amplicons and where you have low viral loads it may pose a challenge to get adequate um amplicon generated with uh, long amplicons and that is why people choose to do short amplicons okay uh, and uh, we have bilal alobaidi who has a question Uh, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, my question is uh, about the error rate. We know that the, in, in Oxford Nanopore technology in general, the error rate for the sequencing is relatively high. So is this going to impact the diagnosis or the genotyping of uh, COVID-19? I mean, are we still going to, are we able to trust the results that are coming from Minayan? or do we have to do another uh, cycle of uh, confirmation and validation using Sanger? So um, this depends on um, what you're doing the sequencing for. If your interest is to generate the sequence for epidemiologic ana analysis, and um, then it, it is sufficient to do nanopore, unless you're looking at an individual case and you're looking at an individual mutation that you want to further functionally validate, in which case you would need alternate technologies for confirmation. But at a broad level for genome sequencing, uh, the way the pipeline is made, including the analysis, the filtering steps, and the consensus generation step, um, allow you to have a genome of very high confidence. Thank you. Um, I see Dr. Naveen Kumar uh, raising hand. Dr. Naveen, do you have any more questions? No, 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 I don't have any questions. Oh. Um, Dr. Subha Pandey has a question. Go ahead, Subha Pandey, you can ask your question. No, ma'am, I have no more questions. If you have any further questions about next generation sequencing project or want to get started with nanopore sequencing, you can always contact us at genomics at genotypic.co.in. Me and my colleagues will get in touch with you. Uh, now that we have had a high level overview of what the technolo technology is capable of, we can all think about how we can use nanopore technology in, nan in COVID situation for sequencing of coronavirus or in any other applications. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudha. Thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. And thank you all participants who have joined us today. Thank you. We thank you, everyone. Oh, uh, just a second, Dr. Sudha. Um, Harpreet Singh Man has a question. Hello? Yes, Harpreet. please. Harpreet Man. Harjit Singh Man. Okay. Hello. Yeah. Am I audible? Yes, yes, you are. Please go ahead. So for water-based epidemiological study, uh, is there any optimized protocol for using uh, clinical sample such as stool as well as environmental sample such as sewage for this kind of sequencing? So people are exploring um, methods for uh, sewage sequencing um, to see um, whatever community transmission and other thing, questions that uh, typically arise in cities. And um, 
one of the things people will have to optimize is the first um, step of uh, sample preparation. Um, how will one extract the RNA or, uh, from the uh, sewage samples and uh, do the amplification, enrichment and amplification. Um, post the amplification, the workflow will remain the same. It will not be different. Um, I think there have been one or two cases where sewage sequencing has happened and uh, we'll be happy to share and support you if you have questions on that. I am interested to develop this kind of project for this uh, SARS-CoV-2 sequencing from these samples. So could sure. you support me in developing this kind of? Yes, Dr. Harpreet. Uh, please get in touch with us and uh, we can discuss. Um, Hello. Okay, Dr. Hajit, we'll be happy to discuss with you post this um, webinar and uh, okay, we can take you. it from there. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudha. Yeah, we have a lot more questions coming in. Uh, so we can take them one on one. We will uh, write back to you. And uh, yeah, uh, because if and there is a lot of request about sharing the presentation as well. Uh, we will try and upload the presentation, the video and share the link with you. And you can always write back to us if you have any projects in the pipeline or if you want to know more about genotypic technology or the nanopore sequencing, how we use for different, different applications, um, you can always free, feel free to uh, contact us. So with that, we'll end the seminar, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sudha. Thank you for all the participants. And uh, please get in touch with us if you have any questions, scientific or otherwise. Have a good day.